1971, after answering an ad in a paper, a group of students are rounded up to be placed into an elaborate experiment that will test the limits of their humanity. They are randomly assigned to play the roles of guard or prisoner. The prisoners have their identities stripped from them and are given a number as their new identity. Meanwhile, the guards are granted power and anonymity. Over the course of the next six days, the experiment collapsed in ways no one could have ever predicted. This experiment sought to study the effects of prison life and how it affected the nature of man. What happens when you put good people in an evil place? Does humanity win over evil or does evil triumph? Now, there are plenty of videos that have already covered the Stanford Prison Experiment in depth, so if you want to learn more specifically about the experiment, check those out. There is also a lot of evidence suggesting that this experiment may not have been as unbiased as previously thought. Philip Zimbardo, the creator of the experiment, even admits to many of these biases. Regardless, I think the experiment still left us with plenty to ponder and debate over. In this video, we will explore the questions posed by Stanford and see how these philosophies translate into Squid Game. In the show, our beloved characters wake up in a strange place dressed exactly alike with a unique number assigned to them just like the Stanford Prison Experiment. Zimbardo says the use of ID numbers was a way to make prisoners feel anonymous. Each prisoner had to be called only by his ID number and could only refer to himself and the other prisoners by this number. This, among other physical changes, were designed to minimize their individuality. It was also a way of getting them to comply with the coercive rules of this experiment. Over the next day or so, the prisoners would quickly unite with one another. In nature, animals will bond with like animals to protect themselves from predators. This is called communal defense. Prey groups actively defend themselves by grouping together, and sometimes by attacking or mobbing a predator, rather than allowing themselves to be passive victims of predation. Sticking together was the best course of survival for the prisoners. Unlucky for them though, Camino defense also exists amongst predators, or in our case, the guards. A fan theory has pointed out that the guards in Squid Game may have been there against their will too. However, because they have power and anonymity, they are more susceptible to giving in to their evil nature. The guards are able to kill so coldly because they can. It's what the group they are bonded to is also doing, therefore it would be unwise to break the pattern. Eat or be eaten. Let's take a look at how communal defense affects the guard psyche during the Stanford Prison Experiment. Zimbardo says the guards were given no specific training on how to be guards. Instead, they were free within limits to do whatever they thought was necessary to maintain law and order in the prison to command the respect of the prisoners. This is the part of the experiment that is heavily debated and there is reasonable evidence to suggest that the guards were told to be mean. They weren't given specific directions on what to do, but they were influenced to act badly towards the prisoners. Then again, as a famous clown once said, madness is like gravity. All it takes is a little push. Day one, the guards dealt out general expected harassment, things like waking the prisoners up in the middle of the night for roll calls, calling them names, making them do push-ups as punishment. But you can only take so much harassment before someone pushes back. Any rebellion amongst the prisoners caused the guards to become increasingly sinister with their punishments in order to keep them in check. They sprayed the prisoners with fire extinguishers when they rebelled. They stole their beds and clothes to humiliate them and make them as uncomfortable as possible. They created a solitary confinement area for anyone who chose to rebel and labeled them bad prisoners. When the guards had exhausted all ideas for physical harassment, Things took an interesting turn as the guards began to employ psychological tactics instead. One of the most infamous examples of psychological torture from this experiment is the story of prisoner 819. 819 fell ill during the experiment. He became hysterical and refused to eat. It was clear he had been pushed well beyond his limit and needed medical attention. He was told to go rest in a room outside of the prison and that he would be excused from the experiment soon. While he was resting, the guards lined up the other prisoners and had them chant, 819 is a bad prisoner, loudly and repeatedly. When Zimbardo goes to check on 819, he is found sobbing uncontrollably and requesting that he be taken back to the prison. Despite his ill state, he did not want to be labeled a bad prisoner. He did not want to feel as if he had let his fellow prisoners down, and to prove it, 
he would happily go back to the horrible conditions of this experiment, even though freedom was right within his reach. This phenomenon is known as crab theory. Live crabs are typically kept in buckets because of their bizarre nature to not let any crab escape. Though any single crab could escape easily, the other crabs will pull them back down and prevent them from getting out. Maybe this explains why everyone decided to go back to Squid Game even after being granted freedom in episode 2. They certainly went back for a chance at the money, but I also think there was an inner guilt they felt about having let the other contestants down. The goal of the guards in the Stanford prison experiment was to keep the prisoners together but not united. They still took measures to cause mistrust between the prisoners and disrupt their notion of communal defense. We can see this exact phenomenon reflected in Squid Game. What you see in the show is the splintering of the group as a whole, and in its place, smaller groups of communal defense start to form. The Stanford prison experiment was supposed to last two weeks, however, the conditions collapsed so quickly that the experiment was called off after just six days. At the end, the prisoners were overjoyed that their hell had been cut short. Interestingly enough, it is reported that the guards were largely upset that it was all over so quickly. Was it because they thought they had failed or done something wrong, or were they enjoying their power so much that they were upset they couldn't exercise their authority anymore? If it is the latter, this might explain why the guards in the show keep returning to Squid Game and might even explain why the frontman chose to go back as well. Maybe it wasn't about the money or the perks. Maybe they just enjoyed exercising power over others. So much so that they would gladly take the role whenever they were called to do so. The frontman is an interesting character. It was revealed that he was once the winner of Squid Game. Why would someone who went through something so hellish come back to impose the same pain on other people? As bizarre as it may be, there is a parallel here with the Stanford prison experiment as well. During the construction of the fake prison, Zimbardo called upon experienced consultants to make sure the look and feel of this prison would be as authentic as possible. One of these consultants was a former prisoner who had spent close to 17 years behind bars. This man was later placed as the head of the parole board and would make decisions on whether the prisoners had earned parole or not. You would think that a man who had been through the experience of a real prison would be sympathetic to those going through a similar experience. However, Zimbardo reveals, during the parole hearings, we also witnessed an unexpected metamorphosis of our prison consultant as he adopted the role of head of the parole board. He literally became the most hated authoritarian official imaginable, so much so that when it was over, he felt sick at who he had become. His own tormentor who had previously rejected his annual parole request for 16 years when he was a prisoner. Is it a deep, primal human desire to impose pain on others so they feel what we felt? Perhaps this psychology helps to explain why the frontman would choose to go back and take the role that he took. So, we're still stuck with this age-old question and fight. Good versus evil. How do we know people will continue to let the good flow out of them? We don't. There will never be a definitive answer to this question or win to this fight. Can you define any one person as entirely good or entirely bad? Unfortunately, it's never that simple. There is a duality that exists inside of all of us. Every single one of us has the capacity to be good and to be evil. Even in the show, it's hard to say that any one character is entirely good or entirely bad. Except for this beautiful bastard. Oh, you poor, gullible, sweet summer child. We see almost every character in the show tip between the scale of good and evil based on the choices that they make. Gihan lived a lifestyle that was very damaging to himself and the people that he loved the most. And yet, in the games, he's sticking up for every other character and trying to be as honest as he can be. So, does that make him a good person? or a bad person. Sang Wu makes very selfish choices throughout the show in the name of winning and survival, and it's easy to paint him as the villain. And yet, in his final moments, he thinks of his mother and makes a sacrifice that allows Gi-hun to win Squid Game. Sang Wu knows that Gi-hun will not allow his mother to suffer. So is this choice that he made still selfish or selfless? And does this overall make Sang Wu a good person or a bad person? There's just no easy answer, is there? The optimistic side of me would like to believe that I would carry the same empathy that Gi-hun did if I ever found myself forced to compete inside of Squid Games, but the pessimistic side of me believes that there's probably more song Wu in me than I would care to admit. What wouldn't any of us do to ensure our survival even if it meant that other people suffered? 
Survival is the most basic human instinct, and it will make people do things they could never imagine themselves doing. So it's a really good thing that Squid Game isn't real, and none of us are ever going to have to find out whether we're more like Yi Hun or Song Wu. Most of us likely believe ourselves to be good people, but if we're being honest, I'm sure all of us can think of things that we've done in our lives that we aren't entirely proud of. Does that make us bad or evil people? No, of course not, because human beings are far too complex to be defined by any one singular event. There's an old Cherokee folktale that sums it up beautifully. The story goes that there's two wolves caught in an eternal battle inside of all of us. One wolf represents joy, happiness, and all things good. The other wolf represents anger, arrogance, and all things evil. But which one wins? The one you feed. In other words, the more you align yourself with positive things in life and make positive choices, the more likely you are to yield positive results. And if you align yourself with negative things in life and make negative choices, the more likely you are to yield negative results. And maybe life can really just be that simple. But hey, we want to hear from you. What did you think about this Stanford experiment versus Squid Game analysis? What did you think of the video? And what are your philosophies on the notion of good and evil? We'd love to hear from you in the comments. Subscribe, hit the like button, and we'll see you next time.